got to uh, the children's home right a little bit before 9 o'clock mountain time and got to enjoy all, most all the stuff that was going on and left for time to get home just a little bit about after 10 o'clock central time last night. Slept good, but yeah, like that. Good. I could have used a bigger nap this afternoon, but it just didn't didn't come along. Uh, but yeah, enjoyable. I uh, had a good service this morning. So proud of Jeremy, the way he lay singing. And it's, it's good to be here this evening close today. I didn't take a nap, but I woke up several times. <laughs> Understand how that goes. I do that sometimes when I'm driving. It's like, oh, here I am. Alright, for our lesson this evening, oh, the blessing of the Lord be upon you. Bless you the name of the Lord. Thank you. We're going to look at a lesson from 1 Samuel, chapter 17, verses 1 to 11. Fairly long to read here. One of my favorite Bible characters, uh, David, and at a time when he's very young, and he's you. And we know the story. So we'll just have some insights on it this evening. Now the Philistines gathered their army survival, and they were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Soko and Azekah in Ephes Damon. And so the army of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah, and drew up in line the battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And there came out of the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gad, whose height was six cubits in a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs, and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. Shack, his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, his shield bearer went before him. His shield was so big, somebody had to carry it for him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. You know, as you read down through there and look at all that armor and how he was dressed, he's like a tank. He's like a tank. Who would want to fight somebody like that? Romans chapter 8, verse 31, the very last part of it says, If God is for us, who can be against us? If you believe that, you're going to find a way to get through whatever battle of life that, that, that you come into. So that's a good place to begin in this story. And from our reading, we find that the army of Israel under Saul, they're prepared to go into battle against the Philistines at Soko, that's how I pronounce it, in Judea. As the account unfolds, Goliath is challenging the army of Israel. You might wonder how the whole army would cower and cringe in the sight of one man. But Goliath, again, he wasn't an ordinary man. He was a giant, nine and a half feet tall, according to verse 4. His spear was as big as a weaver's beam, 
Now, if you're weaving a blanket, you're talking about crocheting a, a, a blanket that's packed the size of this room, but but imagine a blank, just a blanket, how big that weaver's beam would be in, in shuttling back and forth to get the, uh, the threads compacted together to make a, a blanket or some type of material. Uh, but the head of it weighed 20 pounds. You imagine that. Here's a spear that he's going to use and maybe even throw, but the head of it's 20 pounds. Uh, what 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 is it that a shot put weighs? I think it's 16 pounds. 16 I was about pounds, that. and they've got to get it go like that to toss it. And boy, it takes a lot of a lot of practice and and some muscle. But that's a spear on the end of that weaver's beam sized spear. The shield's so big it took a normal sized man just to carry it in front of him. And when he gets in battle, he's going to pick it up and go like this and pick off arrows. And like I say, with all the armor that he's got, he's like a tank. And this giant came out. He comes out and out of the Philistine camp every day, challenges Israel to send out their champion to fight one on one. Winner take all. And that's what verses 8 through 10 is talking about. You send out your champion, which should have been Saul, right? Saul is head and shoulders above every other man. He's the tallest man in Israel. He's the champion. He should be out there fighting, but he's not going to do it. And this challenge keeps coming. What? 40 days, if you see in verse 16. He does this for 40 days over and over again. Here, here, here are these two enemy armies, one on one mountain, one on the other, and this giant comes out every day, makes this challenge, and for 40 days, here's this other army, and they don't dare go out. They're not sending anybody out. For 40 days, the warriors of Israel trembled at the sight and the challenge of Goliath, verses 11 and verse 24. Yeah, they're afraid. And why wouldn't they be? Why wouldn't they be? if they're looking at it in a secular way, if they're just looking at it physically. Among those who were afraid were the three oldest sons of Jesse, Eliab, Abinadab, and Shammah. In verse 13, you see their names there. Now. They were old enough, they could be warriors. And they could go fight in Saul's army. But in the previous chapter, we find out that all three of these men were rejected when Samuel goes to anoint the next king of Israel. Remember, Saul had pretty much turned his back on God and doing things God's way. The Lord tells Samuel, go, go, go to Jesse's house there and anoint another king. So he goes to Jesse's house, right? And, and David's out tending the sheep. And here come all the sons of Jesse. And the Lord says, not that one, <laughs> not that one, not that, not Eliab, not, not Abinadab, not Shammah, no, none of these. Don't you have another son, Jesse? Well, there's another one. He's the youngest, but he's out tending the sheep. Why? Well, because he's young and because he's ruddy and but he's a stripling. You know what a stripling is. Best description I've ever heard of that is, well, you go to your refrigerator, you get the bacon out, you pull out a strip of bacon. That's what a stripling would look like. He, he's not much of anything. But the king, or I'm sorry, the Lord.
Lord looks at the heart when he chooses his servants. And these three oldest sons of Jesse who were there for 40 days listening to this challenge, they did not have a heart for God. Saul did not have a heart for God. They seemed brave. They joined the army, didn't they? But it turned out they really did not have what it took to be a leader of God's people. God knew that beforehand, but now here you see them cowering in the face of these challenges by Goliath. And then there's David, the youngest son of Jesse. He's in an awkward position, isn't he? His heart's desire was to be with King Saul and with his brothers on the battlefield. But he wasn't old enough. He wasn't strong enough to be a full-fledged warrior. He's just a teenager. Very young. But his father did allow him to split time between keeping the sheep and taking provisions to his brothers. You can do that. You, you, you can take food and whatever, and then, by the way, hey, take take a gift to, to Saul that, you know, he'll look favorably upon your brothers if anything happens. His father allowed him to do that. That's verse 15. He would take provisions to his brothers, learn of their well-being, take news of them and the battle back to his father. Now on this one particular day, David arrived as the armies began to array themselves in battle. Here they are. They're going to get ready to do battle again. Forty days. They've, they've gone through this. Hey, by that time we can call it a ritual, right? It's a ritual. The Philistines get ready for battle. The Israelites get ready for battle. And Goliath parades out and makes his challenge. There's no battle. Eventually you get tired of that, right? The soldiers should get tired of that. But they don't. Because nobody's going to accept that challenge. Well, David arrives right at the time they're arraying themselves for battle. And we know how the story ends, don't we? Goliath taunts Israel. David slays Goliath becomes a hero, eventually becomes the king of Israel. That's the story we know, isn't it? But, but, David had to overcome obstacles just to get in the battle, didn't he? It just wasn't, I'm gonna go fight that giant. First of all, as he talked with his brothers, Goliath appeared and challenged Israel once again, and all the Israelite soldiers ran away in fear. Look at verse 26, 1 Samuel 17. And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? And who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David looked at the situation differently than what Saul looked at it, what his brothers looked at it, and all the other men were there. He looked at it as if God was in control. That made all the difference in the world, didn't it? If God's in control, and we believe that God's in control, if we believe that God's in control, then God's going to bring out the right result the proper result. God's in control. So he saw Goliath as no different than any other man in an opposing army that taunts not the Israelites, not Saul, but taunts God. The second thing he had to overcome was his family's doubts and objections. Verses 28 and 29. Well, 
what's it, what is it, brothers? What are they saying? What are you doing here? He came to bring them provisions, right? But when he brings provisions, he goes up to see how they're doing because they're arrayed for battle. And he comes up, hey, how's it going? How's, how's the battle going? What are you doing here? You don't belong here. You're not capable of being here. You're being nosy. You're putting yourself someplace where you don't belong. Who's watching the sheep? His father wouldn't have sent him if somebody else wasn't watching the sheep. The father sent for him to bring provisions for them because he cared about them. I know you, you just want to see a battle. You, you want to see the... Now, hey, don't we want to see what's going on? Fire trucks go by, a police car goes by, we rush out to see what's going on. <laughs> we want to know what's happening, right? Well, that's what he was doing. But then he gets really slammed. You're just egging the men on to fight. That's what you're doing. You just want to see a fight. You, David, you don't know what's going on here. He's challenging for one man to come out and fight. And, and if we lose, the whole army loses. The whole nation loses. You don't know what's on the line here, David. See what his own brothers are throwing at him in this obstacle? Look at verse 29. And David said, what have I done now? Was it not but a word? Did, and, and, and really what he said, didn't I just ask a question? Well, they took the question as being interference. David, this isn't any of your matter. This, this is our matter. We're, we are the warriors here. We're the army. You're just somebody who brings uh, provisions and goes home and tells dad how everything's going. So don't interfere with what we're doing. But see, David knew what he was going to do. He was just merely asking, what's the reward for the person who that the person received for doing this, for killing this person. He knew what he was going to do. He had a plan. He had a plan because he faced other challenges in his life. He knew how to attack and he knew how to put trust. The third thing he had to overcome, when all this was reported to King Saul, David had to overcome the age factor, verse 33, right? And this is where David's faith in God is really evident. What can you do? You're just a kid. A ruddy little kid. You're just a stripling hill. What can you do against that giant? So he's got to defend himself. Verse 34 through first part of 36. And David said to Saul, your servant, now notice that, I'm not here to boss you, Saul, I'm here to do service. Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered him out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by the beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears. I've got a reputation. I've got some experience with fighting, with cruel animals. And basically, that's what Goliath is turning out to be, a cruel animal, isn't it? Six. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. But that's the, the point there. It's about God. It's about God's will. It's about what God wants done. And with all of Israel cowering, the armies cowering, here's one man who's 
willing to stand up and do the will of God. David's reliance was on God. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 37, the very first part of that verse, and David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And thus, that's, that's what the title of the lesson is, say. The Lord will deliver me. That was his faith. That was his trust in God. It doesn't mean he didn't have a plan. He had a plan of attack. He knew what to do. He knew how he would do it. He just had to be given permission from the king. Okay, go do it. His reliance was on God. When men rely on the wrong things, they eventually fail. Saul wanted David to take his armor. Verse 38. Here's Saul who's head and shoulders taller than any other man in Israel. Here's David who's a ruddy little stripling, a teenager. <laughs> and Saul says, here, take my armor. <laughs> it's like uh, it, it, it's like a little leaguer taking Johnny Bench's catcher's equipment and trying to catch him a, a, a major league game. It, it isn't going to work. And he hasn't tried it. It's clumsy. It's going to get him in trouble. It, that could get him killed. Well, having not tested, David found to be a hindrance rather than a help. And, uh, but, hey, a lot of people, a lot of human beings rely on their wealth, their relationships, their own strength to uphold them in times of trouble. It won't work. You have to rely on God. Because if the worst thing happens, you better have your reliance on God. Because that's the only way. The worst thing happens when you get beat, when you get killed. There's always eternity to think. Now, the most important thing for is that David went to battle Goliath in full confidence of faith. Verses 40 and 48. But uh, again, he had a plan. He knew what to do. In both of those verses, he ran toward Goliath. And then he ran toward the Philistine army at a time when the whole army of Israel had been retreating. He went forward. He didn't retreat. He didn't go backwards. He went forward. How mobile was Goliath? He had to have a little boy take him by the hand and lead him out on the battlefield. Go back and look at that old chapter, look at that text. Many say, well, he had bad eyesight because as a giant, one of the things, they could have bad eyesight, right? And some of the things that are being said between Dave, Goliath and David that Goliath is saying gives the indication that He's not giving a clear picture of David. And he wants David to come closer. David's going to come closer. When he comes closer, he's going to come with a slingshot and a stone. And he's going to catch Goliath by surprise. And he's going to hit him in a spot where he isn't protected. David had a plan, and he trusted in God and, and what he had planned to do, he accomplished. But see, he ran, he ran toward him. And then he takes, after he knocks him down, knocks him out, he takes the sword and cuts his head off. And then they chase the Philistine army. Destroyed. So, 
Conclusion. How do we handle our battles for the Lord? Do we retreat? Or are we like David, stepping around the obstacles, pushing aside the trappings that only interfere, and advancing the cause of Christ in a world full of God's enemies? Well, here's the most important factor. Where we kind of began with the sermon part of it, back to the scripture reading, right? If God is for us, who could be against us? The ultimate victory is the victory of faith that brings us into a right relationship with God. That's our lesson for this evening. Again, I, I love those character studies where uh, the individual's faith is presented, encouragement is there. What can we do without those great heroes? Thank you for your time and your attention. If you have any budget requests, be made known, so stay in the same invitation.